So, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this special broadcast, which is being uh, hosted by Friends of the Earth Malta in collaboration with Love and Malta. Um, with us this evening, we have four Maltese MEPs. Uh, we have uh, Nationalist Party MEP David Kaza, uh, as well as MEPs Josiane Kutayar, Alfred Sant, and Cyrus Engier from the Labour camp. Uh, with them, we're going to be discussing the EU, its work, uh, outlook for the future, as well as uh, whether or not it's doing enough to adhere to one of its founding principles, uh, solidarity. Um, rather than just, just ask questions myself, uh, Friends of the Earth Malta has, uh, for the past couple of weeks, been collecting uh, questions from you, the public, uh, which I will be putting to our MEPs. Uh, we're going to speaking with each MEP individually so that we can get a better idea of, of their views and, and uh, without too much interruption. Um, so our first MEP for today is uh, David Kaza. First of all, thank you, Mr. Kaza, for accepting our invitation and for taking time out what must be a very busy schedule uh, to speak to us. Thank you so much for, for inviting me, actually. Uh, so the way I've decided to do this is start off with a couple of introductory questions myself, um, and then we'll move on to the questions people have, have sent in. Um, so, Mr. Kaz, as you, as you know, uh, this Q&A session is part of a project by Friends of the Earth Malta, um, focusing on solidarity across the EU, uh, both within the context of, of the current COVID-19 pandemic, but also kind of uh, more broadly. Um, so a survey commissioned by the European Parliament in, in 2020 found that a majority of EU citizens uh, were dissatisfied with solidarity shown between member states, uh, both during the pandemic, but I mean, it's, I think it's safe to say that the feeling is also there uh, beyond uh, the pandemic. Uh, would you agree that there's a lack of solidarity? I mean, do you see it being enacted on sort of both an institutional level and also between member states, uh, especially from the environmental and social perspective? Well, not really. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me give some, some examples. First of all, the COVID-19 pandemic was unforeseen, radical, and uh, as you may know, and now, of course, it was uh, very aggressive. The knee-jerk reaction was to revert back to, uh, to a nation-state um, um, uh, situation, but but of course, cooperation among the EU states came came much later. Discussion and planning, of course, were needed, um, but the result showed a number of things. Um, uh, and now we know this, of course, by hindsight, you know. And what were such such results? We have to speak about what were what were the results. First of all an EU open platform for scientific data research on handling the pandemic. Um, the platform provides open and free access to information, such as uh, information for governments to respond to the most pressing social needs, um, um, but also the information equipped societies with informed strategies to deal with the uh, um, with the crisis, as well as shines light on those left behind. <laughs> um, we also have EU funding to member states to help um, with recovery through the next generation EU, through which millions, uh, millions are given uh, in aid uh, for countries which is separate from um, normal EU funding. This besides the, the funds to help the most deprived through the ESF Plus, for which um, I led, uh, as you might know, the negotiations. And finally, um, we have seen the, uh, the sharing of, uh, we call it PPEs, it means the uh, uh, personal protective equipment masks and vaccines across the EU to recover um, as a block. And in, in, in these um, cases, EU institutions and member states had to work together closely. Uh, and so therefore, at the end, we, we made it together. And so you mentioned how at the start, kind of every, every country went, <laughs> went for itself, basically. There was this, 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 this kind of reversion back to uh, the nationalistic kind of, you know, we look after ourselves. Would you say that this is, is, is a problem with the EU, something inherent in it, and that kind of when it comes to the economy, we're kind of very open, but then we lack um, the, the, the process maybe to act in unison when, when something like this happens. Would, would you say that's a fair assessment? Well, f f first of all, um, most, uh, more trust is needed. Yeah. 
and the EU needed uh, a couple of weeks to start a common response to the COVID to the COVID um, nineteen pandemic. Uh, this threatened, of course, its credibility. But I, I really believe that it was quick to remedy its stance. Also, even member states need, uh, I believe, need to trust each other more because it is only through trust that we, uh, as an EU, can continue to lead uh, on a global level, basically. Uh, so, uh, and the fact, so more, speaking more broadly, uh, it, how, how realistic is it to expect um, solidarity to be at the forefront of the country's agenda? I mean, at the end of the day, every country has its own interests and, and, and can be expected to, uh, to pursue those interests. Um, is it is, is it something that that is realistically achievable? Well, working together, more trust. Yes, uh, um, I agree. It would it would be a pity to go back to to normal without learning um, uh, these lessons of, of the pandemic. Um, um, uh, well, I, I can continue. Now, um, for example, what are the lessons that we need to take? I would say that, that there are three lessons basically, and we, we should concentrate on on, on yeah. these on these lessons. I mean, one is environmental, uh, social, and political. First, from an environmental perspective, environment um, environmental de degradation. Uh, proved to uh, to contribute to the rise in the pandemic, as as, as very well known now. Secondly, from a social perspective, um, the pandemic affected people differently. Once again, the poor got poorer, and uh, and uh, were more likely to be left behind. And from a political perspective, um, we need to be humble and seize the opportunity to be, to be better, not just at identifying, but also um, solving problems. But we cannot, of course, leave people behind. In fact, you've brought me to another question I had, which is kind of setting aside COVID for, 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 for a while. Um, when it comes to kind of the way the economy functions, the, the EU, obviously, like you mentioned it yourself, inequality has increased as a result of COVID, but it was there before. It is to a certain extent a part of a result of the economic system we have, uh, as is environmental degradation. Do you, do you feel that, that, that the, this COVID recovery can, can bring about actual kind of real change or is it just going to be business as usual, you know, we'll pick up where we left off and maybe uh, some things that need to be addressed will remain unaddressed? Um, I think it, it is clear that, uh, the, global, uh, that the, the global problem is being led by, by, by the EU. We can see this in different ways. Firstly, um, environmental targets are being largely met. Secondly, aid was provided to local communities and cities uh, to lead the way by tackling problems uh, from, from the bottom up. And thirdly, um, the EU is being open on the relationship between the economy and the environment. This is the sort of transparency we need. And finally, I think um, change doesn't happen, happen by hiding problems, as was the case in China at the start of the pandemic. The EU is ready to be um, a leader in transparency in all areas. And I think this is essential to all global problems. Okay. So, so there is there is this hope for for, for uh, change that is kind of real because in in a sense you know it's it's I, I guess there's two ways of going about change you can either incentivize you know people to uh, to do good but you can also create uh, restrictions on kind of what maybe even certain companies can do and I mean the EU is a leader in kind of terms of having uh, standards kind of um, and, and across the board but. Do you feel that there's the need for more of, of, of this, you know, like even in terms of when it comes to companies and the way they operate and kind of, you know, let's take the environment, for example, um, better restrictions on, 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 on what, what companies can and can't do? Yes, I believe that we can always improve and, you know, we are not perfect. 
Uh, we try to be perfect, but it doesn't always happen. So yes, <laughs> with the with the uh, help of everyone, and when I mean when I say everyone, I don't I don't just refer to politicians, but to to the private sector, to governments. We can we can we can become better, and we have we can have a better situation than that we than than we have today. Okay, so I, I'm now going to move on to some some questions that that, that we've had sent in. Um, uh, for you to answer. Um, so the first one is, uh, is about biodiversity. Um, biodiversity in Malta. And, and uh, the question is, um, what are you doing for Malta's biodiversity? And can you make the environment more of a priority? Yes. Um, we can always make the environment more of a priority, of course. Um, climate change is par excellence a global gov governance issue. And, and I believe that it cannot it cannot be addressed in an isolated matter. Um, was, what, what does the, the data show us? Um, it shows us that those countries um, making the best progress are those with strong political, um, strong uh, democratic institutions. On the other hand, those countries that struggle uh, uh, with weak governments and that are prone to corruption uh, are more likely to be way behind their, env their environmental targets. So what is my work? Um, of course, my work is to strengthen the institutions and to tackle corruption um, so that we may spend less time focusing on saving our economies and our citizens from inept and corrupt governments, and at the same time, um, dedicating resources uh, to, to battering um, our, our environments. Unfortunately, um, we, are, we are seeing this happening in Malta, but um, let me see how to say this. Let me see how to say this. Uh, um, it is impossible to talk about radically changing the way we view our environments when something as basic as not building in an ODZ, an, an, an ODZ uh, is, is a mission impossible, let's be honest. Yes, and, I, and to, to a certain extent, as, as you said, and there is this quite a bit of overlap, I guess, between the way institutions work, the rule of law and the environment, because at the end of the day, um, a lot of the environmental degradation that we see around us, I suppose, is a result of people not not following rules and and, and legislation and um, yeah. so okay i have another question um related but um uh, so the question is uh, what can be done to help young farmers get started um agriculture is not an industry of the past uh, but i believe it is um a, a keystone sector in our collective future, of course. Um, of all farms, imagine, of all farms in the EU, just over one in 10 I run, are, are run by, by farmers under the age of, if I'm not mistaken, 40. So aging farmers receive, okay, huge subsidies, but we need to, to attract young people uh, to remain sustainable in the sector. It's not easy, but we need to do that. And uh, from my work in, in social and economic and social and economic committee, um, it would be good to, uh, to see how we can attract talent by incorporating technology and innovation um, um, with agriculture. And uh, a common European policy will assist in this, I think, and innovation can... Um, uh, can can still happen in one of our older sectors known to humankind. So we have to see how to do that. Okay. So innovation and kind of giving people skills and kind of in a sense elevating the profession. Yeah. 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 Um, so okay, we're going to change tack a bit now. Um, and we have a question asking about tax harmonization. Specifically, what are your thoughts um, on tax harmonization? We know that uh, lately even the G7 has, has, has uh, agreed to, to, to work towards uh, a common, common uh, tax rate. Um, do you support uh, the, the, this, the, this concept uh, across the EU? I mean, it's, it's obviously detrimental to Malta, but what are your thoughts? Well, my responsibility is, uh, is first and foremost to the Maltese people who have um, trusted me 
uh, to represent their interests. Our position is that tax harmonization is detrimental to the livelihoods of many Maltese. Universal corporate um, tax seeks to address chiefly problems with um, tax avoidance. Actually, a main contributor um, to this is precisely weak institutions, weak regulators that cannot operate without government interference. Um, and this means millions lost to offshore tax havens. Um, universal, um, I, was, I was about to, because I have to be careful on how, on how to, to, to reply to this. We have a problem. And universal corporate tax in the EU will, will not address corruption issues at all. And this should be a priority. We can tackle the problem of the problems of tax evasion without delivering a body blow to the Maltese economy because it will create a lot of problems. With um, the recent grey listing, um, as you very well know, by FATF, I think the problems are very clear. Um, we had been advocating the, solu the, the solutions for, for a long time. But I mean, even within the context of, of, of European solidarity, I, mean, I guess there is an argument to make that can, we are, in a sense, taking tax money from from other countries you know it, it's it's uh, it is isn't it time that we kind of repurpose the the Maltese economy uh, going forward to embrace kind of technologies of, of the future even if it is detrimental in the short term our interest is is uh, Malta of course um, we can discuss this for a longer time <laughs> but our interest remains um, uh, the interest of the Maltese and Gossetan people. So we, we, we joined Europe not to have a straight jacket and one size fits all situations. And um, on tax, we are very clear. Um, we have a lot of pressure, of course, here. Um, a lot of other small countries have uh, <clears throat> the same problem as, as we do. But of course, our um, foremost um, uh, interest is that of protecting our economy and uh, for the Maltese and uh, the other people. Uh, okay, and uh, so this one is about it, it, it's linked to COVID. Um, so this question is what is your view on the idea of waiving intellectual property rights concerning vaccines? Okay. Um, patent waiver is um, one way of of, of, uh, of dealing with health health crisis that the world has seen in the past. It is controversial at a, as it is technically illegal. Um, however, international law plays uh, uh, plays on on the border between law and policy. Uh, it remains. Uh, it remains a tool in, in the arsenal of global governments, but it, it has to be used, I, I, I say, cautiously. Uh, the aim is to get, the, get out of this pandemic without compromising on effective um, vaccine delivery around the world, but by still upholding the rule of law in many applications as possible. Um, patent waivers look good on paper, but in reality, um, uh, the, the payoff, how am I going to put this? Um, the payoff appears to be limited for what it, it compromises. Uh, plenty more vaccines are being produced, so this case must be um, contested um, from AIDS medication where alternatives were not as available. Um, the actual issue is production of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And the EU has been dealing with Oxford AstraZeneca in, in, in a very clear way uh, to the advantage of uh, its European citizens. It would be different if Europe um, was, um, how do you say, if we were producing our own vaccines, which is not the case at all. Um, we must deal with, with, um, with one problem after another. We cannot help others 
um, before we help ourselves. Of course, Europe is not yet out out of the woods, so um, we will have to 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 first fix our own problems, and then, of course, we will we'll see how we can fix other 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 areas. So essentially, you're saying it's it's sharing patents won't solve the problem. It's more a matter of distribution, supply chain, and kind of, and that, that's precisely the EU's focus needs to be. Precisely, agree. Um, so I have a, a question about Malta. I'm not not uh, strictly speaking EU, uh, but I mean, uh, we might as well take a stab at it. So the question is: Malta's richest ten percent now own more than half of the country's wealth. Uh, is this what we want to see? And how can Malta's wealth be proportionally distributed between all classes? <laughs> um, after climate change, the economic equalities um, that we are seeing are the biggest challenge globally. Um, the biggest challenge. The pandemic has accelerated these inequalities. We have been working to help reduce them through my work negotiating the, the European Social Fund Plus and through my work on the Economic and Social Committee. Again, um, we know that what is causing this inequality for functioning institutions is, of course, the greatest um, of the social um, inequality. Uh, How does the... The European Social Funds, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a big package. I mean, would it in, in contribute to, to reducing uh, inequality? I mean, do you see it as, as kind of being a tool for, for, for that? Or, or, or is it um, uh, not related in your, in your view? The, the, I know, look, we have um, a situation where we have very rich states, like, like for example, Singapore who lack democratic um, structures, to be honest. But um, you can see the same inequalities we are, we are heading towards. Um, if we want social, if we want social equality, we must work to fight for stronger democracy. I really believe in this, in this, in this way of how to do politics. We cannot solve the economy without solving first our democracies, and I think this is crucial. And uh, if we do that, I think we would have a, a, a much, a, a much safer and and better, better Europe. So let's let's aim to achieve to achieve that. And of course, what 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 is good for Europe is good for the rest of the world. No? And so I have the last two questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, do you really think it's justified to oppose banning lead shots uh, and continuing to pollute our soils with lead? Okay, uh, our position on this um, had to carefully uh, balance several issues and, and groups, especially domestically, as you as you may <laughs> suspect. Um, as it stands, the, the ban offers limited... Um, limited protection, but nonetheless shifts the burden of proof and targets the wrong people. We need to protect our citizens uh, just as much as our environment. And to do this, our policies require more caution. Okay, uh, last question. So um, how can we build uh, urban gardens in deforested Malta? Okay. Um, the EU supports sustainable urban development. It makes um, it makes hundreds of billions of euro available for every single region through numerous numerous funds. It's up to member states to tap into them, of course, to tap into to tap into them. And uh, um, the question is whether the Maltese government today makes this a priority. That's about um, yeah, no, the same. Are we passing into them enough? Well, let, let, let me give you an example. The, the, the same funding that is available to Copenhagen, to, to Vienna and to Lisbon is available to Malta. So, so it is really up to the Maltese government to make use of these funds responsibly, of course. And again, we know um, what the problems are. So, I mean, the government has to, has to fix its own, its own priorities, not, not high.
Fair enough. Um, so, I mean, that's that's it in terms of the questions. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything else kind of that that, that uh, you wanted to, to, to mention. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for... Thank for, you so uh, much. Please stay tuned. We're going to have uh, Josie and Kutaya up next uh, for another Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you and goodbye. Um, so welcome back uh, to the special broadcast that's been brought to you by Friends of the Earth Malta uh, in collaboration with uh, Love in Malta. Uh, with us uh, now we have M MEP uh, Josiane Kutayar. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and for being here with us uh, tonight. Thank you for the invite and thanks also for this initiative as well as thank you to the public who have participated with their questions. Definitely. And um, so, uh, as you know, this is a, a part of a, a project about um, solidarity within the EU. As you know, it's one of the EU's founding principles. And the project is kind of looking at solidarity, especially in these times of COVID, uh, but also we're touching up on kind of what citizens want to see from the EU going forward, especially now as we look to a a recovery kind of from this uh, the pandemic. And uh, so I'm going to start off with a few questions myself to get us going, and then we'll shift on to uh, the questions sent in by the members of the public. Um, so the first question is, is, is about this concept of, of solidarity. Um, uh, that there is a feeling among kind of people in member states that perhaps um, solidarity is lacking within the EU. Uh, maybe this, this is a, re a result of maybe certain issues or, or uh, other reasons. Um, would you agree, do you see solidarity being enacted on an institutional level, but also between member states? We definitely need more solidarity. So, no, I'm not content enough with the level of solidarity that there is between member states. We cannot say that there is no solidarity at all, because even during the pandemic, when the pandemic struck, there were different instances, and some instances where solidarity was not applied, such as when the, the, at the start there was also the closing of borders even for essential medical supplies to shift from one member state to another. And I believe that was also coming from the fear that member states thought or felt that the EU is not self-sufficient to provide all medical equipment and medical supplies needed for the EU itself. And that goes to show that we need to invest more when it comes to the EU's resilience and even self-sufficiency to certain essential medical products. But then we also saw practical examples of solidarity of member states helping others when it comes to the pandemic. And therefore, we should not only, whilst I agree that there needs to be more solidarity, we should not only stop at the negative aspect. We have to recognize and promote certain examples of good practices. For sure, we need more solidarity, effective solidarity and mandatory solidarity when it comes to migration. We know that it's affecting us directly and this is a common challenge and we should see more effective solidarity when it comes to this aspect. After all, it's not, it's not an issue which Malta on its own or the peripheral countries on their own should face and we definitely need to see mandatory solidarity here, mandatory relocation mechanisms. There's the new pact on, on asylum and migration, which is being discussed. I know that this has been an outcry for long years by the affected member states, but we need to continue pushing at it. And over here, we have a situation where countries like ours are being left without adequate solidarity and assistance, and they are carrying a huger burden, a much bigger burden than they can carry. And we also have, obviously, the element, the, the element of human lives being lost at seas, which we cannot ignore. And therefore, all EU, uh, the EU speaks a lot of values, um, and therefore, all EU should protect these values and help effectively. So you've, you've touched upon something, a, a follow-up question I had in mind. So like, so you think it, it should be mandatory more, would that, would, would, would you then agree that kind of there is maybe a fundamental uh, change that needs to happen within the EU to facilitate it being able to maybe take action quicker sometimes, even as we saw with COVID, that this was a slow start, but then we shifted. Um, is, is, it, is it something we can let member states take the initiative of, or would you kind of advocate for it to come from the top sort of, and, and 
Yes, this is a, a pertinent question, I must say. And uh, I think that the pandemic has brought an aspect which we need to look at. So, so it, it brought us thinking about also the aspect of competencies. So it's true. There are competencies which the, the EU institutions need to respect and the EU needs to respect because there is also the subsidiarity clause mm -hmm. and questions of proportionality when taking action. So I believe that within this pandemic, which literally shook the world, it shook everyone beyond national borders, we should look, yes, at even within the discussion of the Conference of the Future of Europe, we should look at where we are heading and whether in certain instances we would like to, the, the member states would like to delegate more power or not. So this is a question which one should look at, but definitely I believe that when it comes to solidarity between member states themselves, irrespective of whether there, it's a question of shared or national or EU competence, more needs to be done and more could be done. In fact, you, you anticipated another question I had, which is about the conference about the future of Europe. You, 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 have, you have some visibility of it, maybe more than others. What do you, what, what do you um, expect the outcomes for, from it to be? Or what would you like to see uh, the, the result be? Yes, so first of all, um, it's an honour for me to be part of the special plenary of the Conference of the Future of Europe. Uh, at the onset, this, this exercise, and I call it an exercise because it's, it's a first, and uh, it's important to recognise that this is an exercise where we need to really make an attempt and really listen to our citizens. So there's been some criticism about whether this exercise will be truly democratic, whether it will truly listen to the citizens and whether it will be truly effective. But we should not shoot it from the onset. And I believe that we need, all of us involved, need to really make an effort to listen to our citizens. Now, in Malta, we have the uh, positive aspect that we are small yeah. and politicians, even our MEPs, myself and colleagues, are more readily available to meet the citizens, the stakeholders, than maybe in larger countries where it's more difficult. But still, I believe that this conference provides an excellent opportunity to listen better to our citizens' demands. So first and foremost, I need to listen from our citizens of where they would like our EU to, to head towards. As an MEP and as a citizen, I have my own opinions and my own principles. First of all, I would like to, to see a more social Europe. And when I speak of a more social Europe, this is something which goes beyond slogans. Yes, the socialist party will, will fight this, this, this cause. However, it needs to be effective and practical. So we need to move from mere slogans to concrete action. And the pandemic has exacerbated even certain vulnerabilities, certain poverty lines, which we must not forget. And therefore, a more social Europe is one which really leaves no one behind. And this also has become a mantra. But we need to really now move from the mantra into effective action. Leaving no one behind means that we need to look at those citizens who are being discriminated against. We have recent cases, even when it comes to the LGBTI community, which we cannot forget. And we always must think beyond national borders. When it comes to fundamental rights, we need to look beyond national borders. And we cannot say we're on top of the index, so we're good. There's sin which needs to be done in every aspect of, of society and that when it comes to equality. And then there's also the aspect of, apart from persons not being discriminated against and persons who are vulnerable, which we need to help, there's the aspect of peripheral regions like ours uh, facing certain, certain challenges, even when it comes to the twin transition of the digital and environmental leaps which we need to make. And therefore, a more social Europe in this regard, for me, it means also pushing the fact that we cannot apply a one-size-fits-all because that may, might be dangerous. And therefore, it's important to have common goals. That's very much important. And to have, yes, ambitious goals, even when it comes to 
the digital and environmental targets. However, we really need to assist certain sectors of our community, even consumers, to ensure that we don't have, for example, transport or energy poverty when it comes to the environmental transitions that we need to make, and to ensure also that sectors and regions such as peripheral islands like ours have the necessary uh, assistance to move forward in a just, just manner in that regard also. Um, so, link to it, I mean, many people might argue that kind of our, our economic system is, is to a certain extent broken, and that it it's kind of has resulted in massive inequality, that even though we talk a lot about the environment, it inevitably results in environmental degradation. I mean, what hope can we do, do we have for a, a fundamental change rather than just kind of, you know, have a few more schemes or initiative, but fundamentally kind of everything remains the way it is. Like, do, do, do you see the COVID recovery as kind of being a paradigm shift or, or is it just going to be kind of more, more of the same, I guess? As a politician, I will push for it to be a paradigm shift. So I don't like um, the wording returning back to normal, because what yeah, I, I, I better like the wording returning back to a new normal, because I would love that our societies, our country, the European Union, and even the world at the end of the day, would learn a lesson or two from this pandemic. And that's very much important. At EU level, we already had certain priorities, such as, as I mentioned, the environmental and the digital transition. The pandemic brought forward certain change in a way because people had the time to think better when it comes to the digital aspect. It increased and forced in certain circumstances the use of digitalization. Digitalization could also help the environmental transition. And within the areas of competence that I also work upon more actively, such as when it comes to tourism, I am campaigning towards returning to a new normal in the sense that we'll have more focus on regenerative tourism, which even goes beyond sustainable tourism. And when we speak of regenerative tourism, we're speaking about the environmental conscious traveler, the environmental conscious policymaker in the tourism field, and also when it comes to regenerating the communities from even an economic and social perspective, so normally tourism goes to the uh, well-known spots. But I would love all our communities to benefit from tourism overflows. And we could even use digit digital apps to help spread tourism in a way that will we'll avoid certain um, uh, numbers going to one place. And you, nowadays there are travelers like I who would look to quieter spots. And we need to help them with digitalization, with facilities, so that those tourists would have these, the availability to know where these quieter spots are. This would help the local communities and those quieter spots to benefit economically. It will help the environment because there is less depletion of natural resources and less strain. So yes, let's take this opportunity of, of the pandemic to build back better, I say, and this environmentally, but even in other aspects. We need to make our societies more resilient, for example, towards future shocks, because today it's a pandemic. In a few years time, we may have another unforeseen shock. And therefore, it's important to put in place resilient mechanisms to help our societies. I mean, arguably, we're already there with, with, with climate change in the sense that we've, we've spoken a lot about the pandemic and, and said kind of how it, it's, it's uh, wreaked havoc on, on, on our economies. But to a certain extent, it, it, it pales in comparison with the threat uh, of, of climate change. Um, they're linked, but in a sense, kind of, we, we haven't we haven't seen the EU. I mean, we, we've heard a lot, and there have been initiatives, but really, in terms of uh, taking the bull by the horns, as they say, and, and addressing it, uh, we haven't we haven't seen much, which is which is groundbreaking. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on on climate change specifically, and kind of how how would we have we have the new climate law, and even the European Parliament took a we took a vote even last week about the climate law. So. Whilst I understand that practically we still need to change and to see the effects 
And yes, it shouldn't be only a not bottom approach in the sense that we need a cultural change because that links maybe into your previous question, which, which I'd link also to answer. So we need a cultural change and educational change. We need to have all citizens on board. I, I do believe that the climate law which the EU is putting forward will be very much important in this regard. Now, how will that be successful? Will it only be by targets? First of all, we need to recognize the fact that the EU on its own cannot, like we can be leaders in the field and it's important to be leaders in the field, but climate change goes beyond EU borders and beyond natural borders. And therefore we have to see how to collaborate with other key international stakeholders in this regard, because it's not only about the EU implementing change, but it's about influencing the world to implement the change. Do you see it happening? As in the, so you spoke about the new laws, and do you feel that slowly, slowly the culture is changing and that um, it is more of a priority on a day-to-day -day basis? Would you say that you can, you can see it? I believe that the younger generations are much more sensitive and eco-conscious in this regard. When I was a, a candidate, we had, and then afterwards when we got elected, those who was, of us who got elected, we had a session with children, which, uh, which the foundation of uh, the President Emeritus, yeah. uh, Mary Louise Collier of Reca, organized. And we had this session with youths and children who were asking us questions. And it was a breath of fresh air even to see how, how these children um, have a, this, this eco-conscious concepts and, and beliefs. And therefore, I believe that, yes, it is changing even more so with the younger generation. I believe that incentives and uh, uh, local incentives even by the government and NGOs and the stakeholders are important to educate even the elder generations because we need to educate everyone, not just the younger ones, because climate change is imminent. It's with us and we need to address it with, with everyone. So I believe, yes, that there is, the, there is this change, but we need to do obviously more. And as I said previously, linking up, we, we, for it, to be successful, we cannot ignore the challenges that exist to help certain communities and regions to develop because otherwise we might have a backlash because we need to keep in mind the social and economic perspective along with the environmental one. For the environmental perspective and aspect to be successful, we need the whole package along. And this is very much, very much important. Okay, um, so we're going to go on to the next one. Um, so this is about uh, tax harmonization. Essentially, it's what are your thoughts on tax harmonization and whether you support uh, universal corporate uh, tax rates across the EU? Yes, so this is a very pertinent discussion at the moment. And on an EU level, there is this push towards tax harmonization. Not even on an EU level, but we saw even on international level discussions with regards to this field. I have to say outright that as a Maltese, knowing the leverage it gives to a small economy such as ours, I have my reservation in this regard and I do um, protect uh, the member state's competence when it comes to tax and fiscal policy in this regard. And Okay, despite the fact that we kind of hope we can oppose it, but should we have our eye on the fact that it could change? And does it, is, is it a good opportunity maybe to repurpose um, our economy and, and, and maybe move away from, as in recognizing that this might change or might be able to delay it, but... Uh, you know, we, we, cannot, we cannot ignore um, what our EU and international counterparts are discussing are proposing and are putting forward. Obviously, at the end of the day, we are living in a world and we're not on our own. However, as I said, we should make sure that policy is done in a way where it doesn't harm us or in a way which could, couldn't um, damage us. So, so in my opinion, as I said, we have to keep in mind that this competence 
gives leeway towards our country in this area. We cannot ignore the international discussions. We cannot ignore proposals being put forward, but we cannot ignore also the fact that um, we are a small economy, a small member state, and we also need to protect areas which are of benefits to us. Um, so the next question is about mobility. Um, when are you going to push for more sustainable mobility in Malta? Yes, more sustainable mobility is, is uh, an important aspect when it comes also to the new climate law and the new strategy, even when it comes to mobility and transport that we are discussing. So I do believe that as an island, it's important for us to make better use of the sea. Mm -hmm. Us and even those coastal areas who, who could make better use of the sea. And yes, seeing um, the fast ferry service in place and other aspects which could help when it comes to, to, the, to the yeah. making better use of the sea are important. But we have to continue thinking of what cleaner mobility would mean. And over here, there are various aspects. There are the aspects of electrification when it comes to the cars, but even I go a step further and we have to start discussing electrification of our fleets. Yes, it's not easy. And when it comes to um, sea transport, it's one of the transports, transport modes which still lags behind and which needs to contribute towards the carbonization. There is a whole discussion at EU level, for example, at the moment going on, regarding the inclusion of the maritime sector and European trading scheme. And this is a discussion which is very relevant for Malta, even knowing that sea transport is very important for us. And over here, my, my, my point of view and my line of policy is also calling towards, yes, all transport modes must contribute towards the carbonization, the maritime sector included. However, we have to keep an eye on the fact that what maritime transport means to Malta is not what it means to other regions. What aviation means to our countries and our citizens, it's not what it means to other countries. And we need to make sure that we don't um, ignore the competitive edge of regions who are dependent on certain modes of transport. And we need to make sure that whilst implementing changes, we don't bring about transport poverty. Now, I'm not saying this to scaremonger, not at all. I believe that with the right policies and with the right balances, we could achieve a fair environmental transition, which leaves no one behind, a just one, which would incorporate the different uh, challenges and yes, the different opportunities, because we've spoken a lot about the challenges which relate to the environmental transition, but we cannot ignore the opportunities that there exists. And I would like, even as a policymaker, it's something that I promote, even within discussions with local stakeholders and EU stakeholders, that there exist opportunities in the environmental transition. And I'd like our SMEs, I'd like our businesses, I'd like our workers and citizens to look into the opportunities that there exist. And our islands, despite having challenges, as as explained, yeah. have also opportunities because the small size is not only a disadvantage, but it is an advantage also. We could also be tested towards certain innovative solutions when it comes to the digital and environmental transitions that we need to make. For example, when it comes to circular economy, when it comes to ecotourism, let's look into these aspects and let's not uh, let the challenges only take over. But on, on the mobility side, though, because obviously we can make better use of, of the sea, maybe public transport, but the, a big aspect of it is also our dependency on the kind of the private car. And as you said, we're small and there are opportunities for very innovative solutions. Like, do you see um, maybe limits on car use? I mean, I know it's not strictly speaking related to, to, to your role as an MVP, but if you were to imagine Malta, would you see kind of 
uh, restrictions on maybe the certain types of car use as being part of the solution, or is it just encouraging people to go electric? But um, would you support, you know, actively maybe saying, you know, you have to park, uh, pay to park over here or, or have certain limits just to get us there? I think this is a, a cultural change that we need to make yeah. here. First of all, let's start by recognizing the fact that as policymakers, whether on a new, on a national level, we have to make sure to address as many bottlenecks as possible which may um, dissuade a private citizen from using public transport. So when it comes to public and mass transport and church transport, we need to always do more. There have been government incentives, even when it comes to free uh, public transport to certain brackets, and this has helped in a way, but I would love to see more use of, of public transport and shared transport. So we haven't got there yet. And you have mentioned um, an initiative which would force, but I yeah. would say that over here we need to uh, educate more and we need to, um, to have a culture change, even by assisting through eliminating bottlenecks. So, Yes, discussions on a metro in our in our country, whilst it, it, I know that there are challenges in that regard, must continue and we must look into them. Um, so, okay, the next question is about, uh, it's, the question is this, uh, what sustainable community-driven practices do you think should be enshrined into legislation in order to protect and respect the environment in Malta, uh, especially when it comes to air and noise pollution? Yes, um, I, I don't have uh, one answer when it comes to this. I believe that it's important that we'll, we'll look at a, a holistic strategy. Yes, incentives in this regard are important. As I mentioned, it's important to look into even individual, individual actions in the sense that when it comes to community-driven actions, individual in a, in a supported manner. So greening, greening areas, greening urban areas, greening our, our homes, whether it's the facades, whether it's the roofs are important. You, the use of solar panels and, and other energy efficient aspects and going on to focusing on the renovation wave, which we're discussing at an EU level, of how we make our buildings more efficient when it comes to energy use is even much important. And whilst local incentives would help, um, education in this regard would also help. Recently, I've been also um, uh, following spots on national television of educational, sp educational uh, spots when it comes to the environment and different aspects. And this is very much important as awareness raising because sometimes we're not, in, in most circumstances, I believe, we're not aware enough of what we are facing when we speak of the environmental change, of the effects that our little action may have actually and this is this is very much important in that regard. Um, yes, this is a, a wide ranging discussion. Yeah, it is. No, no, it is. Was, go on on it for ages. So, <laughs> um, so I have another question, which is not strictly speaking, uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. So, it's um, Malta's richest ten percent now on more than half the country's wealth. Uh, is this what we want to see? And how can Malta's uh, wealth be more proportionally distributed between all classes? Yes, now this is an economic argument <laughs> yes. and a socialist yes. argument at the same time. It is true that there is this gap which exists, and I believe that the pandemic has even increased the gap. And therefore, whilst, um, yes, we'll, have, we'll always have in, in our societies wealth affections, we need to look at how to incentivize and help those who are um, at, at poverty line or who are in a circumstance where they are facing poverty. 
And therefore, yes, it's very much important that we really look into these circumstances. We should never ignore our vulnerable sectors of, 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 this, of, the, of the sectors of, of our society. And it's important to look when we speak of um, gaps. It's not only the wealth gap, may I add. Yes, the wealth gap is there and we need to look into it and not having adequate money to, to go about in life struggling even to address your basics when it comes to paying the rent, maybe when it comes to covering for basic necessities, even food. Let's not run away with the concept that there aren't people in our society who struggle to even provide food for their family, to provide basic food, let alone nutritionist food, which is important. And yes, I've spoken to during the pandemic, even um, uh, educational NGOs, educational um, aspects of our society, and they've yeah. they've spoken about the fact that we had students who, once the pandemic struck, couldn't even follow lessons online because they may not have had the Wi-Fi connection. So, not, when we speak about about um, poverty and the gaps between our societies. Let's think in a wider manner. It's not only about the money, it's about basic access. Basic access to the internet nowadays and having the digital infrastructure, which in this day and age, for me, it's unacceptable that not everyone has it. It's not anymore um, something, it's not a luxury anymore. I say we should look at it as a right as a digital right, and therefore we need to look into yeah. these aspects. And then there are those aspects yeah. which affect everyone across the board, not only the wealthy and the poorer or, or those on a more humble um, uh, living lifestyle, but who affect everyone. And when we speak of social well-being, we shouldn't speak only about the financial income. We should look at other aspects such as uh, gender-based violence such as mental health yeah. um, challenges. We cannot forget these. And when we speak of well-being, we should, we should look at the collective okay. aspect. Gender-based violence and mental health issues affect everyone, irrespective yeah. of their wealth, irrespective of their age, background, and education. Uh, Josiane, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, we're going to cut off to a, to a short break. We're going to see a, a, watch a video about the conference on the future of Europe and we'll be uh, right back. The conference on the future of Europe has begun and it all started here at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Over the coming year, Europeans are being asked for their input to shape the future of the European Union. Facciamo insieme un'Europa più forte più resistente, più democratica, più unita. The conference is divided into themes, ranging from climate change to migration and health to the EU's role in the world. L'Europe n'a pas d'avenir si nos jeunes générations n'ont pas d'avenir en Europe. Everyone can participate by sharing ideas on the multilingual digital platform and taking part in national, regional and local events across the EU. Citizens' panels will discuss the different topics and put forward proposals. The conference is for all Europeans to debate a shared vision of what we want of our union. Ideas, proposals and suggestions will be debated at the conference plenary between representatives of the EU institutions, members of the European Parliament and national parliaments and citizens. Moi, je veux entendre les citoyens dans cette conférence parce que ça tourne autour des citoyens. Je souhaite que cette conférence, en tout cas, sonne l'heure du retour des grands projets, des grandes ambitions, des grands rêves. The conference is expected to deliver conclusions in one year. The EU's institutions will then swiftly examine how best to follow up and ensure citizens' voices are heard.
So uh, welcome back to this special broadcast, which is being uh, brought to you by Friends of the Earth Malta in collaboration with Love and Malta. Uh, our next MEP is uh, Cyrus Engineer. Uh, so first of all, Cyrus, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation. Thank uh, you for having me. So, Cyrus, as you know, this, this session is part of a project uh, uh, by Friends of the Earth Malta, uh, which is focusing on solidarity across the EU, uh, both within the context of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also more broadly. Uh, so, um, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to start off with a couple of uh, productive questions myself, and then we'll move on to questions uh, sent in by members of the public. Um, so, I'd like to start off by asking you uh, about solidarity, how you view it. Um, it's one of the union's founding uh, principles. Uh, but also something that it seems uh, European citizens feel is is, is lacking uh, among mm -hmm. the And um, so, first of all, would you agree that there's a lack of solidarity? Do you see it being enacted uh, both on an institutional and uh, between member states, and especially when it comes to the environmental and, and social perspective? Uh, I, I think that well, as as we all know, solidarity is enshrined uh, in the in the treaties in Article 80. Uh, however, we don't see it that much applied when it comes to things that uh, are des desperately needed at times. Um, if, if we, you mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, and at first we saw uh, the opposite of solidarity with many countries uh, becoming very much self-centered, closing their borders, uh, trying to gain uh, as many um, uh, protective wear and protective things that were needed in hospitals and take them from each other. So we saw a lack of solidarity over there as well. We have seen this for quite a time now on migration, for instance, where we where, where we barely see any solidarity at all between member states. So uh, yes, I, I'm not surprised that people feel that the European Union lacks solidarity, notwithstanding the fact that it is one of its uh, most important values. Um, that said, I think that when um, reality has defend then <laughs> the, the, the things change a bit and we do see solidarity. And I think that uh, by the end of the pandemic, for instance, uh, we have seen a European Union that came together for the first time in an area that it doesn't have any competence in order to make sure that each and every member state has not only got vaccines accessible to it, but at the best price possible. So uh, while we uh, see a lack of solidarity uh, within the European Union uh, many a times, then uh, when there is a very big need and then when there's an emergency and it's time for all of us to unite together, uh, then some solidarity comes through. And I hope that uh, this experience of the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us uh, a lot of things, among which is that there needs to be more cooperation and collaboration between the different member states on various areas, including in the health sector. Till today, the health sector is a uh, sole competence uh, of the member state. We have seen that uh, citizens all across Europe in different surveys and also uh, in, in our country, uh, we're seeing that people want more cooperation between member states when it comes to health. And the proposal by the European Commission for a European Health Union will undoubtedly uh, move towards that. And I hope that such a health union will have at some of its main pillars, uh, patients' needs and access to affordable medicines, which at the end of the day is something very important. We suffer a lot from it uh, in Malta because we're a very small um, member state and therefore pharmaceutical companies might not find us attractive to sell us um, their, their, their products, their medicines. But at the end of the day, should we have the European Commission um, buying pharmaceutical products to all member states, that assures that everyone has accessibility, access to all medicines and at the best price possible. You mentioned how uh, how kind of um, even with the COVID pandemic, it maybe it took it took a while for kind of the EU to start acting as one, and and, and you also mentioned migration where kind of there are different interests. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this speaks to something to a problem maybe that's more fundamental about about the EU and how it works? Like, can we expect uh, twenty seven countries with different interests um, to work together, or is is it realistic? It is realistic and we can work together on those areas that are of common interest to us all. Uh, obviously, there is a discussion going on on whether the, the, how to have the best functioning of the European Union. And at the moment, with the Conference on the Future of Europe, um, I think that it is a 
very good time to discuss the way we function because as we see, um, you know, the, there are different institutions in the European Union, as, as I'm sure everyone is aware, but we might not know exactly how the different institutions work. Uh, that said, uh, as people see many a times in the European Parliament, we have a system where a simple majority decides. In the Council, it is a totally different story. So where you get the 27 different member states, their ministers, uh, or the prime minister of every single member state to decide on issues that are uh, of interest to the whole union. So over there, with the latest big enlargement of the European Union in 2004, when Malta joined, we have seen that it has become much more difficult for uh, 27 member states uh, to agree on the same thing. So many a times we end up with the lowest common denominator uh, on most issues that require uh, unanimity. And many times people expect something much better and people deserve something much better than the lowest common denominator between 27 member states. Because let's take migration, for instance, as an example. Um, we have a, a reality in which a few member states are taking all the burden of, first of all, saving migrants at sea, which is the most important thing, because at the end of the day, uh, nothing matters more than life. So we need to make sure that um, people who are at the risk of drowning are saved uh, in, our, in our seas. But then, uh, even because of the Dublin regulation, for instance, and the way that uh, the system is within council, uh, we find no relocation. So you get a lot of um, asylum seekers in Malta, in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, um, then these are processed. Sometimes people are given refugee status. Sometimes they do not qualify for that status um, and are given subsidiary protection or different other forms of protection or are simply denied asylum and are therefore um, considered as people that need to return back to their countries. But uh, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, uh, reality is that um, it is all the responsibility of that member state uh, to which those asylum seekers arrived in the first place. So uh, whether they are given refugee status, then they cannot move out to another European country. If they are given any type of other protection, they are bound to stay in that one member state. If, if they do not qualify for asylum and need to be sent back um, to their country of origin, it is that member state that ends up having to uh, find the ways and means to return those people back to their country. So, yes, when it comes to migration, for instance, there is lack of solidarity, which is unacceptable. And as a European Parliament, we have spoken and spoken strongly on this, uh, that um, solidarity is a must. There is a majority in Parliament uh, for solidarity, for relocation. And I was um, honored during the past weeks to be given um, the honor to um, take on the task as negotiator for my political group, the Socialists and Democrats, on a number of migration files. And uh, our position as Socialists and Democrats, and uh, it wasn't easy to convince everyone, but, but even in a few weeks, uh, we're getting towards the point where the Socialists are agreeing with us that uh, we should not move on with further discussions when it comes to migration, to, to discuss, for instance, the new Migration and Asylum Pact, unless there is the understanding that the burden will be shared between all 27 member states. And I'm happy that um, we are in line with each other, both myself and my political, my political group, which gives me more strength to negotiate with the other um, political groupings in order to uh, at least uh, achieve a minimum level of solidarity before we can continue discussing other things because everything else is becoming irrelevant unless we address the, the elephant in the room, basically. But I mean, as you said, it's, it, council can hold, can hold things up. As you said, it, 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 unanimity is required. Would you say you're in favor for, for that changing or Just, that it cuts both ways? Uh, just one thing, unanimity is not required when it comes to migration. When it comes to migration, it is qualified majority voting and not unanimity. The problem is that it is that unanimity is always used because um, the European Commission has given up on trying to find 
um, an, an agreement between the 27 member states. The, the European Commission knows that there are some Eastern member states, uh, for instance, Hungary, amongst others, that are not only reluctant, but are totally opposed as to having any uh, migrants within their territory. And unfortunately, we are seeing a situation where the European Commission has given up. And that is unacceptable. The European Commission knows what the treaties say. The European Commission knows what should be done and how decisions should be taken in this regard uh, in Council. And we expect nothing but the European Commission to um, act according to the treaties and see that even in Council, such decisions with regards to migration are taken with a qualified majority vote. That said, even with a qualified majority vote, there might not be uh, a majority uh, for um, burden sharing, let's say, because the uh, Eastern Bloc is quite strong. Uh, there are uh, quite a, a good number of uh, member states representing a very good number of citizens and therefore um, they can block uh, any agreement that can be made. Uh, however, I, I cannot accept that the European Commission simply gives up. I think it is the European Commission as the guarantor of treaties that should take action in this regard and make sure that uh, in this particular um, file on these particular topics, um, the treaties are respected. Um, well, while we're on human rights, because um, you recently voted in favour of, uh, of a report in the European Parliament, which amongst other things was a report about um, sexual health and reproductive rights. But uh, among other things, it sort of says that uh, access to abortion should be, uh, or, or is rather a human right. Now, we know that uh, the subject is a sensitive one in Malta, and uh, there are, in fact, safeguards um, against us uh, having having such, uh, having abortion imposed on us, basically. But... Uh, I, I was curious, where, 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 where would you like to see Malta go when it comes to sexual health and reproductive rights in the future? In fact, none of the, none of the things that we have voted on will be ever imposed on Malta or any other member state because it is member state competence to decide on this. However, this was a matter of principle, a matter of the European Parliament um, standing and uh, giving its voice and making its voice heard uh, on a number of important sexual and reproductive health and rights. Now, uh, the whole report is a very interesting one. It is science-based, and I, I would really love to have everyone read it, because uh, while abortion is uh, a part of this whole uh, report, uh, it is such an extremely good report that it is such a pity that in our country, Malta, the only discussion happening on this report is on safe access to abortion and not discussing all the other important things with regards to sexual health. Uh, I think that if you ask me where, 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 where do I see us in, in a, or where do I want to see us in a, in a few years' time, my, my biggest wish is to have uh, a better sexual health education policy in our country because this is what this report does. This report is based on sexual education. It is the umbrella uh, topic all across the report, and it is so important to have um, sexual health education in our schools based on science and away from, from dogma, because um, we are used to hearing, um, and it is an important view, obviously, the, the, the views of different uh, religions and churches and denominations, that's all important, and it's important to know uh, what these religions say, but at the end of the day, in our schools, we also need to have science-based sexual health education. And this is what the, um, the whole report is about. And that is what I would like to see. Um, sexual health education that is um, given to all our, our young people in our country so that in their experiences then, they could make their uh, decisions based on facts and not on um, fairy tales or, or, or whatever. It is important to um, see what the facts are on these issues and make sure that um, in, in every young person's experience, everyone, everyone passes through these uh, stages in our lives. It is so important to have um, in the, all the information needed to be able to make and take the right decisions at the right time when you need to actually 
uh, take them. And apart from that, then the support speaks of uh, many other important. For instance, I got this email, and and this is why I uh, I always state that first of all, let's not um, be judge people for their decisions. Let's um, listen to what their experiences are and uh, put ourselves in, in in their shoes because uh, it's very difficult um, for many to understand what that particular person or couple would be going through because it is not the experience that we would be facing. So we would not know uh, the reality surrounding certain people. And I received, uh, I received many emails with regards to this report and many people, I was surprised, many people asking me to vote in favor, uh, many others um, asking me to, to vote against. But one of the most um, emails that uh, really struck me was by a woman who told me that um, herself and her husband have spent 25,000 euros uh, trying to um, um, trying to have a child. So they've gone through IVF procedures in our country. They are trying to do um, so, some IVF procedures abroad. And this report, which uh, many are describing as the report that wants to kill babies, is the report that she asked me, she, she pleaded for me to vote in favor of, because through this report, she is seeing that the IVF treatment that she so much needs, that they so much need as a couple, is one of those that is discussed in this report. And, in, and this report says that that kind of treatment should be available in all 27 member states, should be accessible to all EU citizens, and it should be affordable to all EU citizens. So when we put ourselves in these people's shoes, uh, then we can really understand why um, these uh, issues are so important to those who are suffering. For many of us, uh, as happened with divorce 10 years ago, for many of us, divorce meant nothing because yeah. we did not need divorce. For many of us, marriage equality meant nothing because people could get married and had no problems with that. But it is for those that are um, suffering and for those who are experiencing the realities that they are experiencing that these are important. And I will never shy away from um, deciding and voting um, according to my conscience on issues of civil liberties that at the end of the day will give better options and a better life to so many people who are uh, unfortunately suffering uh, as we speak. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, it's the solidarity we're saying. I mean, the EU is, is, is founded on. Um, I, I'm going to shift now to um, um, a bit of an economic question, COVID. Um, as, as we know, you know, the pandemic has, has ravaged our economies um, and we're now looking to rebuild. Um, to those who maybe are frustrated with kind of the way the economic system works, with inequality, environmental degradation as a result, what should we be aiming for uh, when it comes to the COVID recovery? And is it just going to be kind of uh, back to where we were, more of the same? Or do you, do you think that the EU has it in it to, to, to kind of bring about a bit of a paradigm shift and, and uh, shift something more, more, more sustainable in the future? When it comes to what we are preaching and voting on on paper, uh, definitely it's not the return of business as usual. Um, as a European Union, we have come up with a fund, uh, the, the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which has nearly 700 billion euros in it, some 672 billion, if I'm not mistaken, uh, worth of funds that will go towards the different European economy economies in the different member states in order to um, revive our economies. However, one of the conditions that we have made as members of the European Parliament, and it is also the Commission's proposal to be fair, and I believe that Council is, is in line as well, that any recovery should be a just recovery and a, and a green recovery in line with the European Green Deal. So uh, it is important that uh, we do not go back to what we were used to, but to have a new normal that we're hearing so much about. Now, I know it is not easy because uh, at this moment in time, we're all currently experiencing uh, the removal of a number of restrictions. And undoubtedly, after having a lot of restrictions, 
the first uh, thing that anyone would want to do is go back to normal doing the things that we, we used to uh, do before. However, uh, in reality, I believe that we can do all those things uh, in a new learned way. I hope that the pandemic um, has not been a missed opportunity to learn. Um, I mean, each and every one of us, I think, had uh, the chance now to, to learn, to stop and think uh, on a, a number of things that we might have taken for granted before, but uh, during this time, we appreciated to, uh, we learned to appreciate them more. Um, whether it is uh, nature and spending more time in nature, since we have to be socially distant, so we needed to find our, our own space, and which was at the end of the day, we learned how good that was for, for our mental health, because uh, whilst a good environment is undoubtedly um, important for our physical health for because of the air we breathe, it is also so important for, for our mental health. I personally, during this this past year and a half, I learned how important it is for, for myself at least to to go out in nature and spend some time among, you know, over here in Brussels, we have amazing forests where you can go and, and calm yourself from the daily stresses of life. In Malta, we might not have any forests, uh, but we have some small parks, but then we have amazing um, walks in like the Maestral Park, for instance, next to the sea, we have uh, our, our seas, we have our small islands. So uh, nature can give us so much and it is so important that in the, in the recovery that we're going to have, the economic recovery, we, we, all of us, we can do small things in order to have a, a better future. And these small things many a times lead to a huge impact. So uh, let's not shy away from, from, from trying things that we might not have tried before, even in our daily work. Uh, now I've seen that some of us uh, can work for, from home, for instance. Um, I'm not saying that it is 100% uh, healthy because I myself uh, do not like working from home all the time, but I think we can all find a balance. And that balance at the end of the day is very good for our environment. Uh, okay, so the next one is a question um, asking about mobility in Malta. The question is, uh, when are you going to push for more sustainable mobility in Malta? Uh, what, what would you say to that? Um, well, I, it's something that I push for. Um, it is something that I, I really don't like about, about Malta. I think Malta is a fantastic place. It's a, it's a beautiful island, a beautiful country. We do things uh, successfully many, many a times. However, when it comes to um, the way we commute, uh, each and every one of us, so I, I, I'm putting the blame on, on myself as well. Uh, many, many a times we find it so easy to, to use our private vehicles, our cars, uh, to, move around the, to move around the island. And recently, I, I think it was one of those things that came with, with the pandemic and me thinking a bit more um, on what could be done in order for us to change. I tried myself to, to change my, the way that I travel, the way I commute within Malta, uh, because the interesting thing is that, you know, I've lived in Brussels for, uh, for about 10 years now, coming and going, even more, 12 probably. I used to study here, I worked at the Maltese Parliament presentation, now I'm a member of the European Parliament, and in Brussels, I tend to use a bicycle very regularly. I don't say that I use it all the time, but m many of my trips here in Brussels are done using a bicycle. And I always, I always ask myself, but why don't I try this in Malta? Now, uh, the problem with Malta is that our infrastructure is not very well um, equipped uh, for bicycles. Shouldn't and it be? That, sorry? Shouldn't it be? I think it should be. Um, but. Um, a bigger problem is that um, people who drive cars um, are not used to having cyclists in the streets as well. So if you drive a car here in Brussels, you are used to having uh, a big number, a huge number of bicycles in the streets at the same time, and you and everything is integrated together, and there are no major problems. Everyone is used to that, so uh, you know what to do when a bicycle is approaching, etc., etc. 
Uh, and that is something that you don't have a model. So apart from infrastructure, then there also needs to be more education on how to share uh, the same road with other means of transport. So that is something important. I have also tried uh, recently uh, in Malta the electric scooters. So nowadays when I'm in, so I live in Slima uh, and most of the things I do are are held in, in that region, St. Julian, Slima, Gzira, Msida and Valletta more or less. So I have come to realize that I barely need my car uh, in that region. I would need it then if I have a meeting in, in Jar, for instance, or, or a meeting in Rabat. But, but within the region where I live, uh, it's very easy to commute using other means of transport, and I'm trying to, to do that as much as possible, and, and I'm really enjoying it. One of the things that I think we need to change in, in Malta to make this easier is what there is in continental Europe. I, I, I'm afraid that uh, in Malta we have the British system when it comes to our roads, uh, infrastructure, and the way we, we use our roads. Uh, in continental Europe, you realize that the way that the streets are built, even the way where pedestrian crossings are, uh, and the way everything is, it is done with one thing in mind, that the pedestrian is first, the cyclist is second, uh, public transport is third, and then there, there is the right of the private vehicle. Um, but that is the priority. Uh, unfortunately, I think in our case, those priorities are inverted, having first um, the, the private vehicle as the main uh, means of transport, and which is given all priority in our streets, and then the rest uh, come, comes afterwards. For instance, uh, over here in Brussels, if I am walking from uh, point A to point B, I barely have to stop, because even when I'm crossing uh, the, the street, I've got the right to cross first, and you find a pedestrian crossing in every single corner and in all corners. So I think we need a rethink of 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 our of our infrastructure, infrastructure, and uh, we need to have a Brexit, I guess, from our roads. <laughs> well, many would agree with you. Let's hope. Let's hope that we can we can get there. Um, I'm going to move on to some other questions because we have uh, quite a few, and I don't have all the time in the world. Um, so this is about again. It's about the environment. Uh, the question is: um, What sustainable community-driven practices do you think should be enshrined into legislation in order to protect and respect the environment in Malta, um, especially when it comes to air and noise pollution? Uh -huh. So let me start with one thing that uh, I think is very important. Uh, we were discussing the COVID pandemic earlier on and the impact that this has had on our lives. Um, and now I want to look at it from the other perspective. The, uh, the huge sacrifices that we have all made in order to safeguard people's lives. And that was something very important. We, we, we saw solidarity in action in, in all member states uh, and even in Malta, where we um, closed shops, we closed restaurants, we closed gyms. Uh, it, it, over here in Brussels, there were curfews, there, there, there was a lockdown in order to protect each other. So we had a lot of uh, things being done all across the world uh, in solidarity with many a times with people who are more, more vulnerable in order to protect them. So we did that and that was fantastic. However, uh, many of us don't realize that, for instance, in Malta, 500, more than 500 uh, people die every year because of air pollution, because of the emissions that we have in our streets, mainly coming from um, our, our transport. Um, and this is leading to uh, more than 500 people per year losing their lives because of this. So um, what we did for COVID was fantastic, but uh, shouldn't we do something in order to make sure that um, these 500 people, that, so that we protect these 500 people every year? Because and this, is, this was one of the main things why I decided to um, try and as much as possible use alternative means of transport. Um, both in Malta and even here, here in Brussels, because um, I, I, we've done so much to protect people with COVID. Why aren't we doing the same to protect people um, who are uh, dying because of the air that, that we breathe? And I think when one sees the numbers, one realizes how important it is uh, to do something. So 
Um, whether it is enshrined or not, I mean, I, I, I won't go to that uh, discussion as such. But I think each and every one of us um, can be can show solidarity with others, and it could be with ourselves at the end of the day, because we are the ones breathing the air that yeah. we're creating at the end of the day. So it, it's very important that, the, as I said at some point, the small things that we do can have a big impact. If all of us, uh, if we all do these small things, it would, at the end of the day, have a very big impact on our environment. That's a very interesting point. Um, so uh, I have the last couple of questions. Um, so. Well, actually, two are pretty much the same, so I'm going to combine them into one. And, uh, the question is, why are the majority of supermarkets in Malta still packing many of their products in single-use containers? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you think? What... Well, it's, well, I think it's something... Uh, we can speak of the law, and the law has banned single-use plastics, but not all single-use plastics, because there are some plastics that are um, thinner than a certain amount that I, I don't know uh, by a part uh, that are still acceptable, etc. But rather than having legislation, this goes back also to the other issue uh, of transport, etc. We could do our part in this. Um, yes, some supermarkets are still um, giving their um, food in uh, single-use containers. Firstly, we can, as consumers of that supermarket, not accept that. We must make our voice heard that that is unacceptable to us and that we do not want to be served that food in single-use plastic containers. Apart from that, apart from making a stand, because many times we tend to complain on things, but then not take uh, bold stands and tell the, tell the supermarket that you are not happy with, with, with the service that you are given. But apart from that, then we can also take our own containers. So, um, it, you know, everything starts from us. Uh, let's not expect the state to do everything for us. Uh, we should be the ones that take up the initiative, go to the supermarket, take our own containers with us, and ask for the food to be placed in our own containers. It's not a difficult thing to do. And who knows, maybe if there are intelligent supermarkets, they, they would um, do things in a smart way and maybe even offer discounts to those who are using their own um, reusable containers. That would probably... Uh, leads to many of us taking our, our reusable containers instead and also um, give, basically make the product even more profitable for the supermarket itself. Let's hope one of them is watching us. Maybe maybe, maybe they can take on this let's suggestion. Not, let, let's contact them ourselves. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so our last question. Um, it's a bit of a hypothetical one, but um, so what is your utopian vision of Malta in a post-pandemic renaissance and how will you mobilize, uh, would you mobilize each neighborhood's willingness to actively claim and own this vision as their own? Mm. Uh, it's a very difficult question because um, utopias at the end of the day um, <laughs> are just utopias. Um, that said, I would like to, I would love us to to live in a, in a modern society, a society that is, um, uh, I think we need a bit of a paradigm shift in the way we do things. Um, first of all, because this modernity that I'm speaking about, uh, it, could, it could go on all sectors of life. So we could speak on the environment, for instance, and discuss on different ways uh, by which we could be smarter, smarter in the way we build, for instance smarter in the way we we have our road infrastructure system, smarter uh, in the way we introduce uh, green areas within our urban cores, which is something that unfortunately uh, in Malta has failed all, all, all throughout. Uh, then it could be uh, a cultural um, renaissance, which I think is needed, where we appreciate more um, the our, our cultural heritage, which is important, but um, thinking, I think what 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 lacks uh, in in our culture uh, sector is thought provocation, and I think that is very important in a modern society, which then would lead to uh, you know uh, a, diff a change in mentality when it comes to civil rights that uh, everyone should be able to uh, have the right to bodily integrity, for instance, and that people can make their choices for themselves which then leads, and this can keep on leading onto 
onto diff diff different areas. But at the end of the day, this modernist approach in which um, we change the way that we think, I think, and that is the most important thing. And uh, let's not remain um, captives of the fact that we are a small island and keep on thinking uh, through a small island mentality. I think that we can do huge things, not only at a European level, uh, but also globally, but we need to, to break that barrier. There's like a glass ceiling, uh, like there's a glass ceiling for women when it comes to employment. I think there's a glass ceiling for us Maltese, and we need to, we need to break that. And that glass, glass ceiling is, uh, is being put by ourselves in us, in our, in our mind, in our frame of mind, and the way we do and think of things. And I think that one of the most, uh, and just remembering it, and I'll finish off by this, one of the most important things that um, we're doing at the European level is the new European Bauhaus. I don't know if you have uh, heard about it. Uh, the Bauhaus movement was a movement in the 1920s, primarily, that started in Germany, that um, brought together um, architecture, so building, building in a sustainable way and an inclusive way. So, so it was uh, creating living spaces that are um, good for the environment, but also good for different people to live together in, a, in an area where there's inclusion and there's art and culture. And I think that is what we should aim for. And I'm really glad that the European Commission has just launched this initiative the new European Bauhaus uh, for all 27 member states, where there will be money being given to a number of projects that would ultimately, hopefully, lead for to other people investing in buildings that are more green and more inclusive and uh, artistic uh, in themselves. That is the Maltese utopia I dream of. Well, one, one, one. We can only hope. Um, so thank you very, very much again for, for agreeing to be with, with us. Uh, we're going to cut off to a quick break uh, and then we'll be right back. Uh, welcome back uh, to this uh, special broadcast that being brought to you by Friends of BF Malta and collaboration with Love of Malta. Um, we have uh, Dr. Alfred Sant with us, uh, Maltese MEP uh, for the Labour Party. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sant, for agreeing to, to be with us here today. Welcome. Uh, so, as you know, this is a project um, about uh, solidarity uh, in the EU. It's being run by Friends of the Air at Malta. It's centered around um, solidarity, as we've seen it uh, throughout the COVID pandemic, but also more broadly uh, when it comes to the EU uh, and the way it functions. Uh, so I'm going to start off with some, some questions myself and then put to you uh, the questions we have uh, from the members of the public. Um, I don't know if you would agree, but there is a feeling, especially among uh, citizens, that uh, the EU lacks in, in solidarity. Um, would you agree with this? Do you see it being enacted, uh, both on an institutional and uh, between member states? Um, what's your perspective? Well, the, the EU has a dilemma of all states that come together to do common objectives, to carry out common objectives. On the one hand, solidarity to do common actions together, on the other hand, the tension of also defending national interests, as governments see it, as people see it. So that tension is always there. And is it is it reasonable to expect um, countries to, to set aside maybe their national interest and at times work for the, the, the good of the collective? Or are we being maybe a bit naive in thinking that that's, uh, that's ever going to be the case? Depends how you define the collective. Europe is, an, is a continent of nation states. And the EU is a conglomeration of nation states. So if collective is being defined at the na nation state level, that's one thing. If it's going to be defined at EU level, that's another thing, much more complex, much more complicated, much more difficult to carry out. So, so taking, uh, for example, COVID as an example, you will hear a lot about how the EU uh, initially was maybe slow to get going and there wasn't much solidarity and kind of all countries um, went into this nationalistic you know, uh, mindset. And then eventually... Um, there was more uh, synchronization. Is it, do you see it as something fundamental as a problem with the EU and that it needs to maybe reworked to be better able to uh, deal with these problems when they come crop up? Uh, would, would you say it's, it's, it's about kind of the EU fundamentally? Well, it happened in the US as well, which is a federal system that's completely different from the EU model. There were problems within different states in terms of how they manage circulation, free circulation, how they manage uh, vaccination, 
how they manage uh, you know health problems related to covid so it's partly something that's normal when different communities try to cooperate but part of it then is something that is european european based like we had germans sort of doing their best to have masks more than than yeah. other guys did and uh, like malta being accused of having sort of uh, done it on the margin to get more vaccines than it needed it's, it's a kind of normal process in a way. Um, and if i were to ask you the one thing you'd like to see more of in the eu when it comes to solidarity uh, i don't know what's what, what would that be well i believe in the europe of the nation states so in terms of solidarity there's also got to be a better definition of national interests and what is national and what is EU. And that's what I like to see more, a clear definition of where the EU stops and where the nation state begins. Okay. That's becoming less clear with years. Okay. And so, for example, I don't know, I'm thinking of migration as kind of one of the subjects where, where it, it feels there's, there's this, this conflict. <laughs> the point is this, that there are increasingly there are issues which cannot be tackled on a national level. Migration is one of them. But then there's climate change, which is another one on the same basis. And uh, cybernet security, for instance. That's another area where you can't really handle problems on a national basis. Yeah. So increasingly, there are big, big issues that need to be tackled on a, well, continental basis, eventually yeah. on a global basis. But we have to be, have a better definition of what these issues are and how fast, how long can they sort of be taken care of. So you think first we need to actually define what, what they are in order to gauge how well we're doing, in a sense. In, in, in Let's say we have to think more about these issues than we do, because we tackle issues on a one-issue basis, like this pandemic came out of the blue, and then a host of other issues came up that were general. Like, how do you, ha how do you have a Europe of common health policy, for instance? Do we need it or not? Now, we can see that there are areas where we do need it. But if we think about that on a wider basis, same thing happens on cyber, sec cyber security, for instance. At this stage, much of it is done on a national basis. But increasingly, it's got to be done on a continental and global basis. But there must be other issues on the same, on the same lines. And, and do you see us moving towards uh, at least a better appreciation of these problems as such? Or are we still kind of stuck dealing with the comp compartmentalized uh, issues? That is, and do you see us getting to where, where you're talking uh, about us being? I think we're still stuck, but it's normal to be stuck in this kind of basis. It's not something that you just conceptualize and move forward. But as time goes on, then you get better insights into how things develop. Um, so I, I, I'm going to shift now to, to a bit of a question about kind of more broad, I guess, about uh, the economy and how it works. Uh, I guess there's a lot of uh, there's this feeling um, by people that you know, the present system is broken, that there's a uh, great inequality and it's increasing, you know, the environment is never a priority. What hope is there for a, for a real transition now post COVID? Is it just going to be more of the same or, or can we expect a paradigm shift uh, in, in, in kind of the way things are done? Well, to be fair, the EU, for instance, has developed now a new instrument, uh, a, a project by which quite a number of billions of euros are available for a recovery program. And that recovery program is based, in my view, a bit too much on the issues of all the principles you like of uh, the green deal and digitalization. Okay. Too much because it's a bit inflexible in, in its approach and does not really apply well to marginal situations like mold disease. But on the whole, that's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift in terms of you know, taking account of these newly emerging issues, which are continental in scope. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, it's like we, we, we have at the very least made the, the we, we do understand that there is the need for it. Um, whether the, 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 the instrument will kind of be effective in every country in the same way, I guess remains to be seen, but there is this shift, I suppose, to... Yeah, that shift is, is taking place. But again, it's, in my view, uh, not really... Uh, how shall I put it? It's not really taking into account the fact that Europe is still a continent of nation states. So okay. you get these dreamers or these people who live in the Brussels bubble who will think big about doing it on a European scale when you have to take it, take it the other way around, when you have to try to do it from a national basis up rather than from Brussels down. And so like, 
similar to COVID, I guess we can we can talk about climate change because climate change is, is in a sense a, a more of a pressing problem. We've 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 been seeing the signs and. Um, it seems we haven't yet been able to address it uh, completely. I mean, again, there, do you see us uh, understanding it better and kind of uh, managing to bring about uh, real change? Or again, is it something that, because is it just going to get lost in kind of all the, the member states and, and the individual? Yeah, but I mean, of course, there's going to be a lot of bargaining going on. But one has to understand as well the social problems. Talk about social inequality. You don't want to tackle climate change by creating more social inequalities. For instance, those guys in Poland who work in mines, are they just going to be left out in the cold like that because we don't want coal anymore? So unless those problems are tackled at micro, micro or quasi macro, micro level and solutions, just solutions are found to their problems, then uh, we'll have we'll have this kind of, you know, va vient, go and come back, go and come back, stop, go kind of situations. There's the Just Transition Fund, for instance, related to climate change, which is specifically targeted to help those straight of the population, especially in the east of Europe, which still depend on, you know, uh, energy that is no longer going to be acceptable. How they go, get, can transfer transform their lifestyle, their work styles, to be able still to have a good life while changing occupations. Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna shift now to um, some of the questions we've had sent in. Now, some of them are maybe not uh, com completely linked to, to all workers in MFI, but I suppose we can, we can take a stab at it uh, anyway. And um, so the first question is, uh, do you really think it's justified to oppose uh, banning lead shot and continuing to pollute our soils with lead? Again, this has got to be done in a graduated way. Doing something overnight is not on. But okay. if it's a graduated way of doing it and as much as possible trying to get everybody on board, why not? So you would support phasing it out rather than banning it? Um... But not just from the top down. It's got to be discussed at all levels with all those concerns. No, but let's say those concerns insist that, you know, there's, 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 they would like to, it to be banned. I mean, at some point, I suppose the EU must uh, come in and say... Well, back in the 1970s in Malta, there was this proposal to uh, dismantle the British base, which meant numbers of thousands of guys were going to lose their job. They, well, they came on board because there was pro were programs to help them get over it. It's not something that you just say you have to impose it. If you say it that way, it won't work. Okay. Um, so this uh, second question is about tax harmonization. So it's quite simple. I mean, what are your thoughts on tax harmonization? And do you support universal corporate tax rates across the EU? No, I don't. I think uh, it's a question of where you are. If you're in Germany, you support that. If you're in France, you support that. But if you're in Malta, for instance, or in Cyprus or in marginal countries yeah. where you don't have national resources and you have to attract investment, you, you can only attract investment given that you're part of the single market by having some kind of incentive to give. Yeah. And that would be some form of tax competition. But then, of course, clearly that kind of approach can lead to abuses. So there has to be a give and take about that. How do you sort of, how do you meet with the legitimate complaints of other countries that say yeah. that when you sort of put your taxes down to compete, to attract investment, you're really doing that to help money laundering or tax evasion. And that has got to be addressed. We've got a big problem with this. Do you not also think that there's a, an aspect of solidarity in the sense that you are uh, possibly taking the tax money away from other countries and maybe other services and other places where it's needed? Do you, do, do, does this, this, this idea resonate with you at all? Is, is it a legitimate uh, position to hold or is it, you know, it, it, it's all we have and we should be able to keep it? No, what I say is always this, that has to be transparent, whatever you do. So that if you accept investment which accepts or which benefits from your low tax rates, that has got to be published. So that the, 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 um, the countries from which or which think that they are being sort of front loaded out of taxes can know what has been happening and they can take their steps. So I agree with total transparency in terms of who are 
the investors, you want to call them that, will come to you. And totally the transparency in as what they have been paying by way of tax. So while you're not in favor of, the, of it, uh, the harmonization, you would agree with maybe tweaks and changes that we could make uh, to maybe to make it a bit uh, easier to accept. I would, agree, I would agree with total transparency. Okay. And so in, in a sense, this might still happen, whether we, we like it or not. Um, yeah, but watch out, because at the moment, what's being discussed really relates to the big multinationals, the okay. GAFA and the guys who really have big, big turnovers. As of now, they don't come to Malta so much. They only do come to Malta for marginal activities by their standards. But okay. in my view, this is just a foot in the door. So eventually the whole measure will be expanded to cover yeah. other investments that we would be interested in. And so with, with that in mind, um, how should we maybe reposition ourselves, if at all? As in, is there other other changes that we can start to make to prepare for this? Or is it just a matter of, you know, hold off until, um, until we can and, and, and then we'll see? It's a long-term problem. Uh, Malta in the past used to develop its economy on the basis of tourism, industry, and less so agriculture. Yeah. Back in the 1980s and then the 1990s, we shifted to financial services in a big way. Industry declined, agriculture is kaput, basically. And then financial services plus gaming services. That's in the uh, first decade of this, this millennium, if you like, yeah. of this century. And that has really tied our economy to activities that are not so well liked abroad. Yeah. Um, taxation evasion is what it's called by uh, some guys who are not completely wrong. And gaming is also frowned, internet game is also frowned by most national jurisdictions, including the commission. And that's the problem we have. How do we get out of this box? Yeah. Um, so a, a, a linked kind of, uh, well, question in a sense. Um, so Malta's rich, richest 10% now own more than half uh, the country's wealth. Is that what we want to see? And how can Malta's wealth be more proportionately distributed? Yeah, there's a problem by going the way we've been going over the last 40 years. Since the Reagan, Thatcher, revolution, if you like, the state and the importance of the state in economic affairs and then social affairs has really gone down. And the state has become a regulatory mechanism rather than an apportionment of stuff on one base and the other. And then, of course, the technical political stuff that gets competed about in elections is how do you get the consumer to feel better? Yeah. Uh, feel good is one of the major ways by which modern democracies are, are done with, dealt with. That would mean as well, uh, taxation going down. And most promises sometimes go to pro promising the consumer more and the taxpayer having to pay less, which is a bit crazy. And um, so we've had, well, I have this one question about um, what sustainable community driven practices would you like to see uh, enshrined, I guess, into legislation in order to protect the environment in Malta? Um, does anything come to mind when, when, when you hear it that? Won't it won't happen though because it's politically explosive. If an ODZ is an ODZ, it's total ODZ. So if you want to build a hospital in ODZ, no, sorry, you can't. If you want to build a hotel, no, you can't. Total saying no to everything on that basis. It won't happen. And presumably this is linked. So like a, a bit earlier, you mentioned how like agriculture is, is uh, practically, well, you, kaput was the word used. Um, is there anything we can do to, 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 to save the sector? Um, is it just about kind of land use? Is it, uh, is it from an economical perspective not, not viable? Um, what, what do you think? Well, it's land use in a way. For instance, at the moment, there's lots and lots of agriculture, agricultural land that's not being used. In Gozo, for instance, people are not, you know, employing, doing farming on the land. So there's got to be some kind of intervention by the government, which would be politically explosive as well, to rationalize land use. It's been talked about for the last 40, 50 years. Very little has been done about that. And then you just don't train guys, young guys, to become farmers and then leave them, you know, just hanging in the wind. You must provide them with land. Many of them have problems with that. So presumably, I guess, even if, you, if, if, if we were to manage to say, you know, ODZ is ODZ, you do not get to build anything, that would in and of itself of maybe shift, shift it a bit towards or not. 
it would not solve the problem, but it would at, at, at least, at least make, make it clear that there's land that's not there for building or for speculation. Yeah, because presumably at the moment it's being sold to someone who might want to kind of build his, his little uh, ODZ villa as opposed to maybe that land being used. Um, so if, if not, so like you, you mentioned giving, uh, training people and giving them land, like what's, what's the solution? If, is it government taking uh, parcels, part, parcels of land and kind of distributing them to, to young farmers? Uh, how, how do we kind of strengthen the, the industry? Well, it's a bit late in the day. Because once we joined the EU, agriculture in Malta was doomed. We had to apply CAP, Common Agricultural Policy, and that doesn't fit small island regions. Wherever you look at the EU's island regions, their agriculture has really gotten, gotten the clip on the, on, on the jaw, really. So that's the first problem. Uh, we can't get out of CAP, and we have to sort of find niches within it that could perhaps uh, work out. But up to now, those niches have been found, that have been found only satisfy short-term or part-time interests. And it's a problem. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to, a, to another question. Uh, this one is, when are you going to push uh, for more sustainable mobility in Malta? What's sustainable mobility in the sense? What do you mean by that? Well, presumably, I... Assume it's it's uh, less car use and more more, <laughs> more varied transport. From what I can assume from the question, but the tendency is that you know it's it's you know, we talk about um, the modal shift using more public transport. So you know what's what's your view on on this area? Well, if that's going to happen, you have to start taxing car usage. In fact, this what's is the, like, the, the question. Like I've put to many of your colleagues and they all seem to think it's not the way forward. It's about incentivizing people. No, that's uh, I, so you would, you would support, you know, actual restrictions on where you can take your car. You have to pay to park. I mean, this is a central part of kind of but one. The, but then the point is you don't get elected. Eh? The point is not, sorry. The point then is that you don't get elected if you do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. But I think... So is it fair to say that, you know, because um, essentially what we're saying is that if any government ever wants to address sustainable mobility, they have to resign themselves, not getting elected. Is it possible that there's no middle ground, no way we can um, effectively shift to more sustainable practices? Probably there is, but nobody has tried it yet. Nobody will try. <laughs> look, look at what's happened up to now. What we get from the 10T uh, funds yeah. by the EU have been, have been used all the time to create bigger and wider roads. Okay. Under the nationalists from Marsash Lok to, uh, where is it, Gozo, uh, going through Mjar, whatever, and Chirkewa, uh, under the Labour government in terms of more roundabouts and flyovers. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, and in fact, this is the frustration many people feel in the sense that you want to catch the bus, but the bus is stuck in traffic. Um, but like, uh, most politicians tend to always talk about incentivizing people to move on to electric, for example. But it seems to me that's not a very... Yeah, but that's a, that's a different problem. Huh? Electric, change over to electric is not the same problem that we're talking about. This is it. It's, 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 it's a very different uh, problem. It's different not... kettle of fish. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think, yes, yeah, uh, the last question is, um, what is your utopian vision uh, of Malta in a post-pandemic uh, renaissance and how will... And how would you mobilize each neighborhood's willingness to actively claim and own this vision as their own? I don't believe in utopias like that. They just don't, you know, hatch out of an egg. It's got to be a long-term project that's seriously carried out. Problem is we don't have long-term projects usually and we don't carry them out seriously as well. So we have, we're stuck. I think we're stuck on this, on this one. So if I were to ask you kind of what, if you had to choose the long-term vision, um, both for Malta and and the EU, um, and I mean, you might argue that they might be aligned or not. Well, what, what, would you, what would you say it is? Malta's challenge is different from the challenge that the EU as a whole faces. What we need to do is we need to have modernization of our structures. We don't have that. We're still running with old structures that have been PR'd to look nice and you know, glitzy. But we still don't have modern ways of doing things. Our corporations, our companies, our our regulatory agencies, our offices, our police, our law courts, they're still stuck in traditional ways of doing things. 
And the real challenge has been that we have to modernize our structures on a micro basis and on a macro basis. It's very hard to do. People don't like it because it means a change of the life patterns. They don't like that. They're afraid of having to do it. They don't want to be transparent. They don't want to be accountable. But unless we do that, we're not going to do so well. And I guess it's, so as you're saying, it's just a political will, presumably, to, to, to do it. Because, or no, it's, more, other it's, more than, it's more than a political will. It's a communal will. It doesn't have to be a politician wanting to do it and then getting voted out. It's got to be people understanding that they have to change their own lives, not for the worse or for the better, but to make it, you know, more, let me call it, say, modern, whatever that means. We don't do that. But does that mean then that you sort of wait for the, the public to, to, to get to that stage or, or kind of is there is there a way you can push it along? Because in a sense, there's always... The political challenge is to, to uh, you know, to get people to understand this. That's a big political challenge. Yeah, no, it's, it's got to be done, but then it's not a popular way of doing things. And people prefer the popular way of doing things, like having friends of friends to sort of arrange things for you. We like yeah. l'arte di arrangiarsi, come si dice. Yes, no, it's, it's, and, and, and from an EU level, um, so do, do you feel that the, say, there are similar challenges or is it a totally different uh, category? Well, I think the EU has to streamline its objectives. It's got too many objectives at the same time. And then it gets, you know, sometimes caught in a traffic jam. And then when an emergency comes in, that emergency blocks the whole traffic. The current president of the commission, von der Leyen, is saying all the time that she wants to stick to the program she announced and just do that. In a way, she's right. But even then, her program is a bit too, too long. And she herself is getting a bit, you know, um, stuck. So it has to be a streamlining at the top and more subsidiarity in terms of how things are done when big projects come up. Okay. So, so, so in a sense, the EU maybe at times, or the Commission even, like it, it, it bites off more than it can, it can chew. And maybe it's a bit more of an optimistic. Unfortunately yes. Unfortunately, yes. In the past, to be fair, it used to be worse sometimes, huh? because they used to try to get into big details that should have been left to, to national economies. But now I think the challenge, we've already discussed this, is to understand which topics really should be EU-related. And we talked about climate change. Um, cybersecurity is going to be top as well on, on this one. And uh, apart from climate change, environmental, environmental challenges, as well as then other areas like energy, sustainability, and stuff like that. Well, um, that's... That, those were all the questions I have, uh, Dr. Sun. Um, thank you very, very much uh, for yeah. agreeing to be. I hope we didn't overstay the. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. You are actually very, very concise and, in fact, just in time. Um, so, thank you very much. Uh, we've, we've come to the end of, of this uh, QA session. Uh, I hope it was very uh, interesting. Uh, but I'd obviously like to thank uh, our four MEPs uh, for uh, finding time uh, to be here with us. And I'd also like to thank uh, the European Union, which has um, assisted uh, in funding this, this project. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, it's a project um, being run by, by friends of the Earth, Malta, uh, with the support of uh, Love of Malta and, and Darla Europa. Um, just to point out that um, this, this uh, session is going to be uh, submitted as, as feedback for the, the conference uh, about the future of Europe. Um, so everything that has, has been discussed here, all the concerns raised, uh, will also be, be forwarded to the, the, the European Union uh, for them to take on board. Um, so thanks again for being uh, here with us and, and good evening.